model in the cloud. And today we're going to hear from uh, some folks who have been working on uh, adding more data into the sort of common data model and talking about uh, how to handle geometries, swaths, and groups. So I think I'm just going to switch it over to uh, Tim Whitaker. Find you here. And I'm going to make you the presenter, Tim. And I guess Dave would like to say, uh, Dave Blodgett would like to say a few words. Yeah, who that was fun. I just turned my VPN off and thought I disconnected myself. Um, <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you, Rich. Uh, awesome that you're putting these together. Uh, I've really enjoyed this series of, of talks over the last few months. Uh, for those of you that haven't seen some of the recent ones, they've been really good. Um, so I, I wanted to just give a quick introduction to what we're going to be talking about here. Uh, a few months ago, we were finishing up this proposal for simple geometries in NetCDF CF, which came out of a workshop on um, NetCDF Climate and Forecasting 2.0, um, which is kind of this vision in the mist of, of, of sorts um, for uh, some new capabilities in CF that we've all kind of wanted for a long time. And the one that I've kind of wanted for a long time is, is simple geometry. So, points, lines, and polygons, a la geodatabases, um, post just kind of geometries uh, baked into a NetCDF CF binary. Um, so Tim Whitaker and I uh, have, been, have been leading the, the charge on, on this one, uh, and we were going to just talk about that. But uh, very recently, uh, it was really great to see that the SWATH proposal that came out of that, um, or that's been in the works for a long time, um, and the uh, NetCDF four groups um, proposal are are being pushed forward into the community at a little bit higher level, uh, and it was a really good opportunity to get um, all four of these topics or three of these topics uh, in front of the community uh, for a little show and tell. So, so that's what we have. Um, I'm gonna let Tim take it away. He's been kind of leading the charge in terms of. Um, presenting this material um, to various groups over the last few months and has got some really nice slides and kind of just general intro material um, prepared. And then I'll do a quick demo of the work I've I've been doing related to this. Uh, then we'll we'll pass it on. Um, I'm not sure that we did we decide on an order for swaths uh, then groups or groups then swaths. Um, doesn't really matter. I think I think I can go last. Swaths okay. can go last. I think that the Groups could be more interesting for a variety of reasons. <laughs> All right, <laughs> depends who you are, but but okay. So that that'll be the that'll be the order, and um, yeah, take it away, Tim. Thanks. Thanks, Dave. So this is just a quick primer for those of you who may not be that familiar with NetCDF. NetCDF is a scientific data format. It's array oriented. So think about storing data values in an XY grid or XYZ, if you want three-dimensional data in there, and it can store these values through a number of time slices, so X, Y, Z, and T. The data is self-describing or can be self-describing, so the variables that are in your NetCDF file can have attributes tagged to those variables that say things like, oh, this variable has units of measure of whatever, or and uh, a nice human-readable name from this variable is blah, 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 blah. So the CF conventions, a sense for the climate and forecast conventions, this is a, a standard way of prescribing the file structure, the attributes, and standard names associated with these NetCDF variables to facilitate sharing your NetCDF files with others or archiving your files for use later on. If everybody's using similar patterns, then it makes it easy to understand and interpret these NetCDF files. And it also makes it easier to develop tools that can read this structure. The CF conventions are community driven. And in the past couple of years, there's a, a group of us that have been working on a number of proposals to the CF conventions to improve them. Those proposals being related to geometries, groups, and swaths. So in this presentation, you'll see bits about that. We'll start with geometries. Currently in a NetCDF file, so before our proposal, you could already store things like a grid of data values. And this is probably what most of the NetCity of files out in the wild are doing. They're storing gridded data sets. But you can also store discrete sampling geometries. So if I go out on a boat and I take a water sample, I can record just the single latitude and longitude of that point location and represent that in NetCDF. Or I can represent 
simple aggregates of points, so like a, a trajectory, I can store that as well in the current Climate and Forecast Conventions version 1.7. What we want to add with these geometries is the capability of storing line segments or line features and polygons. The motivation for this is something like what you're seeing here. I've got a simulation model that can simulate stream flow in all of my rivers, and it would be nice in my NetCidia file if next to all those stream flow values, I could store the geometry of the river segment associated with that stream flow time series. Similarly, you could think of a watershed model where I want to compute average evapotranspiration from a given watershed area, well, it'd be nice to store the boundary of that watershed area as a polygon in my NetCDF file. So the geometry types that we're including are point, line, and polygon, and that includes both single part features and multi-part features. If you're unfamiliar with the term of a multi-part polygon or feature, think of the states in the United States. Uh, most states you could probably represent as a single polygon, especially if you're looking at it from space. But if you take the state of Hawaii, which is comprised of several islands, then each of those islands is an individual polygon, but together they're one feature, they're one entity. And so that is a multi-part polygon. In this proposal, we are not including curved lines or parametric shapes like circles and ellipses. We'll save that for future work. The types of shapes that we are including are compatible with a lot of other geospatial standards out there. Some of you might be familiar with well-known text. And so the types that you see pictured here from well-known text are the same kinds of features that you can store in our geometries for NetCDF. These, of course, are compatible with OGC simple features since WKT is derived or influenced by OGC, and likewise GeoJSON. Uh, these features can also be represented in shapefile format and various other geospatial database formats. So we tried to target the types of geometries that most people seem to be working with. So let's go through what an existing CF 1.7 NetCDF file might look like. This is without any of the geometries proposals that we're talking about, just to give us a baseline here. Imagine I've got two features, the two gray stars on the right side, and this is these features are in a map, so they have coordinates of six and 12, and uh, the feature two has an x-coordinate of six and a y-coordinate of three. In my NetCDF file, I have three main sections in that file where, where I structure things. And what we're looking at here is a sort of a simple text representation of a NetCDF file. So at the top, I have the dimensions or how much space to allocate in my NetCDF file for stuff that I'm gonna store. In this case, I have two features, so I'll create a dimension called instance, and I'll give it a size of two. Then I have variables in my NetCDF file, and these variables can have attributes. So the three variables I have are lawn, lat, and temperature. Lawn and lat are my longitude and latitude. And I can see lawn has units of degrees east and standard name of longitude. Temperature has units of Celsius. Notice that all of these variables are sized by that instance dimension. That means in this file, I'm gonna store two values of longitude, two values of latitude, and two temperature values, since that's how big my instance dimension is. Also notice on that temperature variable, there's an attribute called coordinates, and the value of that coordinates attribute is lawn and lat. So in the CF conventions, this is how I can associate my temperature values with where they belong in space. I say, oh, okay, temperature is related to longitude and latitude, and that's how I can find them. Finally, at the bottom of this NetCDF file, we have our data values themselves. So there are the two data values for longitude, the two data values for latitude, and then the associated temperature values. Now, as I go through these examples, uh, I don't want this text representation to get out of control. So if we've covered some attributes that I feel are pretty easy to understand, I might just make them disappear, just hide them, because we all know, okay, long is longitude, lat is latitude, and it should make this a little bit easier to read. So let's now incorporate some geometries into this. Let's suppose I want to represent those two stars with two points, and I'll put the points right on top of the stars. I know this is a trivial example, but this will help us get our feet wet with this geometry structure. To represent this with our simple geometries, I need to add a dimension called node. This is how many nodes do I have all together amongst all my geometries in my file? And for this very simple case, I only have two nodes. 
on my temperature variable, just like I had a coordinates attribute that said you can locate me via longitude and latitude, I'm going to add another attribute called geometry that says you can locate my geometry or you can represent me with geometries defined by a geometry container. So then I add a variable called geometry container, which has some attributes that sort of point to other variables that may be useful in describing this geometry. Uh, the geometry container has a geometry type of point and it has no coordinates of x and y. So I'll add these node coordinate variables, x and y, and I can see, okay, units are degrees, and uh, I have a variable representing the x-axis and a variable representing the y-axis. And finally, in my data, I'll need to add those x and y values. And again, this is a trivial example, so they look just like longitude and latitude, but that's the basic structure of these geometries. There's a geometry container that is pointed to from your geometry attribute on the, the temperature variable or whatever variable you're working with. And that geometry container tells you what kind of geometry you're working with and where to find the coordinates for those geometries. Now let's look at something a little bit more interesting. Instead of a single point location, what if I have multipoints? You might have this if you were sampling on a boat out in the ocean, you had a nominal or a primary location in space that you were trying to sample from, but with wind, with waves, with current, there's drift. And so the actual samples you take are going to be tens or maybe hundreds of feet off from where the, your, your initial GPS point was. So the three orange dots at the top are all associated with that gray star in the middle of them. So in this case, I still have two feature instances. I have two sites that I'm trying to sample. But now my node dimension is resized. Instead of being two nodes, I now have a total of seven nodes or seven dots if you were to look on, on the right. In my geometry container, since I have to keep track of how many nodes I have per geometry, I need to add this node count attribute that says, where am I going to find my node counts? And so I add a node count variable that's sized by the number of features I have. So there, I'm going to expect two node counts. Finally, in my data, I have my X and Y. And now you can see there are a few more values there, making this more interesting. And then my node count values say, for my first feature, I have three nodes. And then for my second feature, I have four nodes, the four blue dots at the bottom half of this map. And that's how I can split up those X and Y arrays to know which nodes go with which feature. I just use my node counts. What if I have lines instead? I'm using the same nodes that I had earlier. I've just connected the dots between them. What changes in my file? Well, the structure is actually exactly the same. The only Thing that I need to change is on my geometry container, I've got that geometry type of point. Well, now I'm dealing with lines, so I'll just wiggle that point out of there and add in my line geometry type. And that's it. That's, that's how we transition here. Well, what if I want to add a line to that? So now I've got two features, but the second feature is a multi-line or a line feature that has two separate parts to it. Well, now I've got a total of 10 nodes, so I have to change my node dimension size to be equal to 10. And I have to add a part dimension. In other words, I have to keep track of how many parts I have amongst all my geometries now. My geometry container will need an attribute that says, well, how do I find out about my parts? So I'm going to have a part node count variable that I add. And then finally, in my data values, I have my all the X values and Y values for all those nodes that you see now. I have an updated node count. So the first feature still just has three nodes. The second one has seven nodes. So I know now how to split up my nodes from one feature to another. And then the part node counts tell me how to split up the individual parts from one part to another. So the first feature has three nodes. The first part node count is also three. So I know that once I've counted those first three nodes, the first feature is done. I move on to the second feature. I see the first part of the second feature has four nodes. So I can split it up right there. And the second part of that second feature has three nodes. What about polygons? I've just filled in with a, my little crayon here in between those lines. How does the structure of this file change? Uh, well, it's exactly the same as for that multi-line example, except instead of my geometry type being line, I just have to update it so that it says polygon, and that's it. Now, what about polygons with holes? You can imagine uh, 
a landmass that has a lake in the middle. And I'll maybe want to carve out that lake if I don't care about what's happening in the water there. So that's a hole in my polygon. How do I represent that? I'm going to toggle back to my simple polygons example a little bit, go back and forth. So watch the X and Y values at the bottom. Notice my nodes that make up my hole are just more X and Y values that I add to those uh, X and Y arrays there. Just three more values that get added. And I have to update my node count and my part node count values as well. So I know now that my second feature has three parts and I can see the number of nodes in each of those parts. So that's great. I've got my nodes represented. All this left is to figure out how to tell software that one of those parts is actually a hole that I want to carve out of my polygon. And the way I do that is with a flag saying, are you a hole or not? So on my geometry container, I add an interior ring attribute that says which variable is going to tell you about holes. Well, the name of that variable happens to be interior ring in this example. So I add an interior ring variable and then now watch the data values at the bottom. I add the values for the interior ring and it's as simple as this. If the part, the polygon part is an outer ring or in other words, not a hole, it gets a value of zero. And if it's an interior ring in, or a hole in polygon parlance, then it gets an interior ring value of one. So I can see the first three parts are exterior rings. And the only hole I have is the very last part I've described here, which has that interior ring value of one. So that's it. I'll, I'll let you look at this for three more seconds. <laughs> this is the most complicated example that we have in this simple geometries proposal. So if you look at this and you halfway get it, then congratulations, you're well on your way to understanding our thought model behind this. Wow, so, Tim, that was, okay. Yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that's, uh, that, that was outstanding. Uh, such a, can't even imagine a clearer explanation of this. Uh, thank you for putting together that presentation. Oh, of course. Uh, I'm glad that I had the opportunity to do so. Uh, I'm, I'll probably have to present this in the UK in June, so it's good that I already have this done now. <laughs> now, now, you, now you know why I wanted Tim to do the intro. Wow, yeah. <laughs> right, so we've been working on this for quite a while, actually, two years now. Look at this. And I want to give you the, the roadmap of how we got in, this into the CF convention. So we started May in 2016, and we began with a couple of GitHub projects that served as a sandbox for testing out these ideas with geometry, figuring out the best way to do this. We felt pretty confident about what we were doing over a year later. So we really worked hard at this and we submitted our official proposal to the CF conventions in August of 2017. And this was done via track ticket number 164. So if you go to your favorite search engine and you search for CF track 164, you will see the entire discussion that we've been having in that ticket about these, this proposal. So it was sent out in August of 2017. By February of 2018, after much discussion, the proposal was accepted. And the way the CF conventions are now working is that they're in GitHub. And so if you want to update the conventions, you just write the new version, you submit a pull request to the official GitHub repository for the conventions. And eventually that pull request should be accepted and voila, we're in. Now, perhaps, Fortunately for us, depending on how you look at it, that pull request is still lingering. Whoever pulls the, or you know uh, drives the ship over there on that CF Conventions project hasn't clicked merge yet. And so that hasn't been incorporated into the eventual conventions yet, which is nice because we are making a, a, maybe one or two subtle tweaks, uh, which doesn't affect anything that you saw here today. It's, it's that subtle that we're doing. And these tweaks are related to conformance. So whenever you have the CF, CF conventions, you need something called conformance rules so that people who write software that interpret files that are, are supposedly conform to the CF conventions, you can use these rules to see, do you really conform or not? And some of the way that we had written those conformance rules for geometries weren't ideal uh, based on feedback from David Hassel, Mr. Conformance. And so we're updating that and that is ongoing, but I think it's pretty much final. We're just going to wait and see if anybody yells at us for doing it. So you can expect that uh, to be officially finalized and approved in, well, I won't give any official timeline, but hopefully very soon. If you want to start playing with these geometries now, we have some 
uh, reference implementations that you can look at. There's a Python implementation at the GitHub repository that's linked at the bottom of this slide. And all we're doing here is using Python to go back and forth between these geometries in that CDF and objects in memory in Python. And then you can export out to Shapely objects if you want to. So Shapely is one of the most popular Python libraries for working with vector geometries, like GIS geometries in Python. You can also export out to JSON. Now this isn't GeoJSON, this is just a serialized version of those Python objects, but it was useful for me to write as far as developing unit tests and that kind of thing for. And I thought, well, I just might as well make those methods public in case anybody else thinks it's useful to have just a simple text representation of these CF geometries. So that's there now, you can play with it or even contribute to it because there's certainly work to be done there. And we also have an R implementation. So Rich, this is the part where you switch over to Dave and he can talk about the work he's done. Why'd you put that crazy biker in the middle of all this though? Okay, hold on. <laughs> well, you know, I, 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 pulled, I pulled the community and I did not see anybody more excited about simple geometries than this schmuck. And so- I see, I, I see. I, okay. <laughs> that picture is my proudest moment as a bike racer. I love it. Um, so thank you, Tim, that was really, better than I, I could have imagined. I hadn't seen those slides in the flesh. That was really, really, really well done. Um, so like like Tim said, there's there's a Python implementation and an R implementation. And this is kind of, as we were working through this, I have a pretty firm belief that any standard that gets out there really ought to be implemented prior to being finalized. And uh, if it's not, inevitably you're gonna find issues in it um, and that's, true of some of the standard work I've been doing that's not implemented. I know that we're going to find issues when we implement it. Uh, and so as we went through this, um, one of the early collaborators on, on the work with us, Ben Koziol, um, Tim and I uh, went through and I kind of did the R side, the, the R side, the R implementation. They did the Python implementation. Um, and then we kind of met in the middle with what the standard ought to look like. So um, the, the implementation that I put together landed in this netcdf.dsg repository, which is part of the USGS R kind of ecosystem of um, GitHub R repositories. Uh, it's available if you want to install it using kind of typical install from GitHub. Um, it's also um, going to be available via the kind of standard USGS R repository network soon. Um, so this will be out there soon. It's it's done, I'm pretty, pretty happy with this. It's good test coverage, all that, and I think that the Python implementation is kind of a similar kind of early, high quality, ready to go, ready for people to use. Um, and I was just gonna walk you through, basically the this is the code that's in the vignette for the R package. It's kind of the, the, the how-to manual. Um, and I'm just gonna show you quickly what it does. So I just copied a file from the from the package out into a, dec a directory. Um, and we can take a look at that here. Um, so this is going to look familiar from what um, Tim showed at the beginning of his uh, kind of walkthrough. So here we've got latitude, longitude, time, we've got a station name, um, and then there's a variable of Apple Transpiration. Um, it has coordinates of time, lat, longs. This is this should be pretty familiar, and, and we're in, in CF 1.7. Um, so I'm also going to so I'll just show you a time some time series data. So here's here's the time series data that's that's in that file. Um, and this is, I'm trying to illustrate the real use case that we had for this data, um, as Tim was talking about, you know, say you have um, some time series of, of, of um, water budget variable for a watershed and you wanna store the watershed polygon along with those water budget variables through time. Um, well, so here I've got my, my um, HUC as a hydrologic unit code. So here are the, the polygons for those um, hydrologic units. We can put those on a map. Um, so here we are. Um, these are two hydrologic units uh, in, so we're in Northern North Carolina. Um, and just threw those on a leaflet map so we can see where in the world we are. Um, and so this is the, the, the meat of what's been put together in this R implementation is a function, it's just two NCDFSG for simple geometry. Um, so I just did that. Um, and I can do the same thing. So. Basically what I did is I said, let's write this to a NetCDF file. Now if I come over here and look at the header of this NetCDF file, same, same NetCDF file, it now contains all the content from this, what was actually a shapefile or I, I believe GeoJSON or 
a simple geometry kind of standard standard file. So we now have a whole bunch of attributes. These are the, the attribute table for those of you familiar with kind of the simple geometry, simple features. Um, so here's a collection of attributes that came along with those polygons. And then down at the bottom, we have um, X and Y, which is a node um, dimensioned thing. Uh, there's a geometry container uh, and we've got our node count uh, and a grid mapping. So I've, I've included that this is a latitude longitude. Um, this, this R implementation uh, implements the mapping from Proj4 um, and the kind of standard projection libraries in R into the NetCDF CF grid mapping um, syntax. So that's a that's a value to anybody if you're interested in that that code or those functions. Um, if you want to go to from a proj4 string into the grid mapping, it's it's been implemented there. And we've updated our our conventions to CF 1.8, uh, which doesn't exist yet, but uh, that was the the best thing we could do. So now there's a function from NCDFSG where I can read this um, hook polygons NC and um, write that back out to shapefile. Um, and if we go to, this is the last piece of my demo. So I just wrote this out today, 252. Um, that's interesting, it should be three. It didn't overwrite. Well, that was the one that I did before the demo. We can open this up in QGIS. So I just read from a NetCDF file and wrote to a shapefile and we can open this up in QGIS and get those geometries. Um, so this is a, this is pretty gee whiz to me, being able to go um, from standard GIS to NetCDF back to standard GIS and it all works um, and we can kind of round trip it. So hopefully that's a um, kind of case in point of what, what Tim shared and, and drives home um, what this is all about a little further. And um, if you're interested, if you have a use for this, um, please, please, please come and check out the Python or R packages and um, break them and let us know how we can fix them because we want to we want to improve this stuff um, through through real use. So that is what I have on this topic. Awesome. That that is cool. I love the, I love the round tripping. Um, does, I'm going to unmute everybody just for. Uh... Uh, see if there's any questions at this point before we move on. Oh, like the one other, one other thing I just to, just so it's been mentioned, um, if you go and I believe Tim Tim, did you have a link to the CF conventions in your slides? I did not, but it's pretty easy to Google it. So if you go to the CF conventions, um, actually you did have this pull request 115 listed. So if you go to the CF conventions. Uh, GitHub repository, pull request 115 is where um, the contribution of this kind of happened or is happening. Uh, and note it says and GitHub experimentation uh, because the the CF community is is in process migrating from track to, to GitHub for issues and pull requests and that kind of thing. Um, so there's a little dirty laundry in here, uh, but it may be of interest to, to people that are interested in how GitHub works for these kinds of things. So um, that's the one other thing I want to just not not forget to mention. All right, thanks, Dave. Um, does anybody have a question at this point? Uh, yes. Uh, should I introduce myself or just ask a question? I, uh, yeah, sure. Who, introduce yourself. Hi, uh, it's uh, Sergey Panov. I'm I work for Vysola uh, Weather Raiders. And, uh, so we, we have a product which is called Catchments which is basically a bunch of watershed areas with uh, rain accumulation and it can be time series of that. Uh, but in this case, you have to actually identify a bunch of catchments. Uh, when you were talking in the first part of the talk, when you describe how you're going to put those polygons into uh, NetCDF files, uh, I didn't see any way to identify those polygons. So it was clear that there was one polygon, another polygon, another polygon, and then there was a hole in the polygon. But is there is a way to assign some unique ID, like integer unique ID or some string name, so that later we can refer to it in our time series data. Yeah, T Tim, do you want to take that one or should I? Uh, actually, Dave, your example, I thought illustrated that very well with the attributes that you included in your output. Oh, sure, so if I 
share again. Yeah. Um, so that's actually included in the NetCDF discrete sampling geometry standard, which is probably why we didn't show it. Oh, that scrolled fast. Um, so this, this station name variable has a standard name of um, station ID. And I believe there should be a Yeah, the CF, sorry, I'm looking, looking and not seeing what I'm looking for. Um, there's also the CF role of time series ID. Um, and this time series ID is where what the, the, the CF community uses to identify the identifier of the, the feature, essentially. Um, and I guess, Tim, am I blanking? Are, is there an, a, a similar thing in the geometry container? Well, the, the geometries, you get one geometry per instance. And right. So in your example, the instances are the stations. Yeah. Uh, so as long as you have another variable like polygon ID that is sized by that same instance dimension, the NetCDF software knows to automatically associate that ID attribute with your polygon features and with the data associated with those polygon features and right. so on. It does it so all based on those dimensions. Yeah. And so so exactly. And and similar to. Um, simple features, the, the the OGC standard. Um, there's no mechanism to say this is the primary ID. You you just basically can give a whole bunch of attributes. So like I have a, a TNM ID and a, a you know a, there's the source feet is a, a, another ID, right? So these are just attributes that exist on the station dimension, um, and you would infer through that dimension relationship which you know which attribute goes with which geometry. Okay, did I get, did I get it right that uh, when I have multiple cachements, I have to have uh, multiple stations, multiple station IDs, and, and each cachement will have its own station ID. Uh, and, and if cachement, I, I usually cachements, so I, you use different terms for that, uh, don't have holes, but theoretically it might. So you, you have, yeah. So if you define one area, and this area might be one polygon, two polygons, and polygons with hole, uh, they all group together under one station ID. And and then I can have, uh, is it is it possible to have a to put to pair multiple stations, right? So I have well one NetCD file that defines multiple stations. So each catchment area will have its own station ID and station, right? Yeah, yeah, that's definitely possible. And this the CF role of time series ID is the kind of formalism that CF has in the case that you have multiple time series associated with points or lines or polygons, um, the, um, this, the variable that has a CF role of time series ID is the basically the primary identifier for each of the, the time series, um, which would have an associated um, feature. I, th and I think that's answering your question. Um, yeah, it's definitely all possible, so. for maybe, maybe using different language here. So. Yes. Uh, so then I, I have another question. So suppose I have a storm tracking uh, output, and I want to provide a time series of storm, uh, and storm is moving. So I will have idea of storm, and it will have a. It's a point in in your uh, model. It will be a point, and it has different lat long, uh, and they will be changed every five minutes or every four minutes. So that will be a time series of actual coordinates, but ID will be the same. Is it possible? using your model to store that type of time series? So for that, I would direct you to the discrete sampling geometries um, part of the climate forecasting specification, because what you're talking about is actually um, probably a trajectory, um, and that's a pre-existing data type. Yeah, I think I think we need to, uh, let, let's... Yeah, okay. should, I think we need to move along. That's a that was a great that's a great question though. Um, I'm not sure trajectory. Well, uh, anyway, okay. I think we need. So actually, let me do a, a time check here. Daniel, about how much material do you have? And um, and Alexander, how much do you have? Oh, uh, I've got about I'd say seven to eight minutes of material. This is going to be fairly high level compared to the previous presentations. Okay. And Alexander, uh, yeah, I can talk as long as long as you allow me, and you know, you know don't. Don't shut the meeting. You have that capability, Rich. So that, okay, that's why you're last. 
<laughs> yeah, <exactly. laughs> okay. Okay, Daniel, I'm going to switch you. I'm going to make you the presenter. Um, yeah. Let's see here. Okay. You should be able to share now. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Rich. Um, so, hi, everyone. I'm Daniel Lee. I'm from UMETSAT. And today I'm going to be talking about the CF2 group proposal. Um, is my go to meeting window blocked part of the presentation right now? I meant to make that go away. Okay. So this is going to be let, much more standard spaced, much less technical uh, as compared to the previous presentation. I hope I don't bore you guys too much. Um, but part of the reason why it's that way is because what we're proposing is uh, not as complex, and so there's just not as much uh, as much to talk about, in my opinion. So it's not quite as a uh, as uh, comprehensive as uh, as the discrete sampling geometries. So let's see if I can switch this. Yeah, why does the group's proposal exist? Well. Basically, because NetCDF3 um, or NetCDF Classic, which was the standard for which the CF conventions were written, is a, a flat data model. So it's really good for storing things like uh, the kind of imagery that we produce at UMETSAT. So we have a single viewing geometry, uh, sensors all using the same scanning characteristics. Um, and so you can represent this as a number of layers on top of each other or you can divide the layers up uh, across a single array, however you like to do that. And this is what was possible in NetCDF3. Um, and since NetCDF3, of course, there's now NetCDF4, which is much newer than the CF conventions. And NetCDF4 has a bunch of interesting things that you can do. For example, um, you can represent data hierarchically, which is much more akin to how data is structured in the real world or how the real world is structured. And this is very interesting for me from UMETSAT because we're launching a new generation of satellites very soon. And this is just one of the new satellites we'll be launching, part of the MetOp second generation. That's a tandem satellite. And it has basically half of the instrument payload of the series. And as you can see, those are six instruments. And I can tell you that each of these instruments has different viewing geometries different scanning characteristics. For any given observation, you'll have various quality information that will be associated with the data in different ways. And so if you're taking, for example, an orbit or part of a pass that is picked up by one of our ground stations, you might want to store all of this data together, associate it with each other, the different observations, the various sensors. And so they have a lot of things in common. They're all from the same orbit. Any maneuvering information from the satellite is the same. But at the same time, uh, the, a lot of things are different. Like I said, the quality of the geometries, et cetera. And so using the grouping mechanism, which is available through NetCDF4, makes it possible to represent this data in a single file rather than spreading this out amongst several files, which uh, have the possibility of perhaps getting lost in transfer or what have you. And I'm talking at length about our use case, because that's what interests me from UMETSAP, but there are, of course, other use cases for storing data and structuring it hierarchically. For example, if you have a lot of data which is related to each other, but there are some intrinsic differences in the data, for example, multi-model collections, or if you're comparing in situ versus remote sensing data, what have you, it might make sense to store these as various groups or as part of a group tree in a single NetCDF file. And the same applies to ensemble forecasts. Uh, and I think there are also some really interesting ways that you could apply this in the context of discrete sampling geometries, where this dovetails with the previous proposal, uh, especially if you're dealing with trajectories through time um, that might produce ragged arrays or you know, whatever. You're not wanting to iterate through a long array, that type of thing. So there are lots of interesting things you could do with groups. But unfortunately, this isn't covered by the CF1 standard. So I have to say I've come fairly late to this proposal. A lot of the work has been done by Charlie Zender, who unfortunately couldn't be here tonight or this afternoon in American time. Um, and the work that has been done on the, the proposal is based on these design principles. Basically, we try to be as backwards compatible with CF1 as possible. 
And this is done through making it possible to take a hierarchical NetCDF file and flatten that out into a flat file if needed, with the motivation of being able to programmatically support legacy software, um, taking a, a hierarchical data set and turning it into a series of flat files if needed for interpretation through software, which isn't going to be updated to CF2. And also just for the purpose of consistency. And uh, so that's backwards compatibility. The basic principle of the thing is that, like you saw in the previous proposal, oftentimes in NetCDF files, you'll refer to other attributes or variables, and you want to be able to find them. Well, in a flat file that's fairly straightforward, you use the name. Um, and if you're using CF2 groups, then you would either use the unqualified name or use an absolute path. And how you actually find the thing that you're looking for is done through scoping, using normal scoping patterns that everybody hopefully knows from the Algol family of languages and several other contexts. So what are the rules? They boil down to this. If you have data in a given group, it's visible to all the members of child groups, and so they can refer back to that data. And uh, in addition, you can refer to things by their absolute or relative paths. So if you have a path from the root of a file, um, then you don't actually need to know where the variable that is calling up that variable is located within the file. You just use that path to access it. Relative paths work just like in a Unix file system. And if you're using an unqualified name, then there's a search strategy which is defined. And this is pretty straightforward. First, you do an ancestor search, and then you search down the hierarchy in a width-wide fashion. So you traverse one tier of the hierarchy of groups from left to right until you find the thing that you're looking for. That sounds complex. It's actually not. So this is a figure taken directly out of the proposal. Um, and it is showing a fairly common data structure for NASA remote sensing data. And we're going to start down in the, um, can I do this? Yes, I can. We're going to start down here in this corner. This is um, what to start with. So this would be the structure of the NetCDF file. This is the root level. So it might contain global data attributes. In fact, it should contain global, global data attributes. And then in this example, we've got four subgroups of root, namely geo for geolocation, meta for general metadata, sci for science, and other for any other data that you want, might want to store. And each of these groups can be divided into further subgroups until, until you're done dividing it up. And in this example, we'll start down here. So we're in the science group, group one, group one. So this is three levels down from root. And somewhere in here, we have a variable which calls up coordinates using the name coordinates. And so the first thing that you would do according to the, the proposal would be to look in your current group. So do I have a variable which is called coordinates? If you don't, then you traverse all of the intermediate groups between all the parent groups until you reach the apex group, which in this case is root. So you go up here to psi g1, and there's no coordinates there. So you go up to psi, look for them there. If you don't find them there, then you go up to the root. Um, so in most cases, I think you would find what you're looking for somewhere during the ancestor search. But in case you don't, then you would go down one level and search through um, the levels of this higher of this tier from left to right. So first search in geo, then in meta, and then in other. And then you would go down in this order. So from left to right, geo g1, geo g2. Then we've exhausted the geo group, so we go to meta g1. There's no meta g2, so we go into science. But we've already searched that one, so we can skip it. Then we go to psi g2. And now we've exhausted the groups on that tier, so we go down one more. And in our hypothetical example, you would find the coordinates variable within the geo g1, g1 group. So the function of that is basically to cover all cases. I haven't seen data like that in the wild, but maybe it exists. I'm trying to reclaim my mouse. Here we go. We also outline a number of best practices so basically, 
conform with CF1 as much as possible. Uh, use accepted data types. Um, also, don't use group attributes to substitute for variable attributes, even though if you're thinking in terms of scoping, you might take things like fill values, maximum values, minimum values, and store them on the level of a group. If all the variables within that group share them, um, that's not how those attributes are intended to be used, so please don't do it. And also, because software may be required to dismember these, um, these group files, please don't make the group names the only source of metadata that tells you what the group is. You should store the meaning of a group within attributes within that group. Um, the group names are fine for human interpretation, but they shouldn't be required to be interpreted by software. Where are we at? How did we get here? And where are we going? Uh, the whole thing started in September 2013 in the CF mailing list, and these are all linked into the presentation. I posted the URL at the beginning, so you can um, find them and read up on them if you're interested. In June 2017, the state of discussion was put into a Google Doc, um, and the state of that was presented at last year's EarthCube NetCDF CF workshop, um, and that allowed us to converge a little bit more. We also have a working software implementation, which is the work of Charlie Zender. Um, that is uh, the NCOs. They support this proposal as a version 4 step 4, which was released earlier this year. And now we've migrated the work to a GitHub repository in the NASA DIWG. And uh, we're hoping to, we're planning to present this at the next NetCDF CF workshop in June in England. So we'd be happy to have any contributions from the community um, on moving forward on that. And with that, I've reached the end of my slides. Awesome, thank you, Daniel. That was that was great, actually. I uh, I was one of those early sort of group detractors at one of those early meetings, but now I'm a group enthusiast. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anybody else for the question? Um, you might have to unmute yourself. Okay, well, it's great to see this. Uh, these things that have taken so long in the uh, development actually reaching fruition. It's exciting. Okay, Alexander, I'm gonna make you the presenter. You should be able to share your screen. Yep, no problem. Looking good? All right, I'll increase my font just in case. Yeah, so I have looking... no fancy, fancy polygon plots. Uh, you know, plotting satellite related stuff is kind of more complicated than a few polygons, so I apologize. But, uh, and um, no historical diagram how all this work came to be, but I, I think I can say um, that I first heard of some kind of attempts to standardize how to encode satellite data, satellite SWOT data in, in CF, uh, probably 2009, 2010 on the CF satellite mailing list. And so um, uh, that's how long it took. But uh, this, I think, is the closest it ever have been. And we'll see what happens. Uh, but me, I, uh, I work for an hour for the HDF group. Uh, I used to work for uh, NOAA Center for Satellite Applications and Research. That's part of NESDIS at NOAA. And I was, you know, in my previous life, a satellite remote sensing scientist doing things, um, deriving various things from satellite data. Um, the, this document is, um, as you can see, it's in the final draft stage. Uh, we, we lack a more fancier terminology like ISO standards or OGC standards. So final draft means the authors of this document ran out of things they want to put in. So based on some obvious problems or feedback from the community, uh, we're kind of done and the date is here when we make the last small change or whatever kind of change. So there is no, uh, so we are kind of done as far as the, the, the content, content of this proposal. Uh, the um, one important thing is this proposal is not about all kinds of data that can be acquired by instruments on satellites. Uh, there, are, there are some satellite instruments that um, are already covered by CF uh, convention. For example, um, satellite, satellite instruments that sort of make observations by shooting some kind of a laser beam or a radar signal a pulse uh, 
you know, down to Earth, sort of like a nadir observing satellites. They, that kind of data can already be stored in CF using a trajectory profile. So this proposal is kind of covering other cases of satellite data that are not covered right now in the, in the CF convention. Um, and uh, how we came about these things, we scoured, uh, you know, we, we searched, we collected, we contacted people that we know from personal contacts and various data um, archives about samples of satellite data files and we looked into the how the, the, the data is encoded in them and then we try to de to observe patterns and then when we classified into patterns we kind of came up with the with a number of, of possible encodings and then we named those encodings uh, and basically we extended in some cases where we thought that obvious case was missing but it was clear that if someone decides to go that way there should be an encoding or encoding already in the convention so we try to avoid thinking that data providers think about how to do this, because especially in terms of satellite missions, it's a multi-year effort. And typically, at some point of time, these decisions are being made. And then coming back and trying to change things where the software is being developed, what they call ground processing software, um, it's kind of complicated. So we try to develop um, encodings that are kind of even forward looking. Uh, not just what the currently is uh, done. And so uh, the part about coordinates, it's really for the com you know, com completeness of this document. I don't think we're going to talk about them when actually whatever part of this document actually gets into the CF convention. Um, as already uh, previous uh, presenters mentioned, uh, this proposal will be part of that CF workshop next month in England. So we'll see what happens. Uh, some early ideas are that this is going to be a, an appendix of the CF convention document, but we'll see. But anyway, some form of this document will go in. Uh, so coordinates, the only really big novelty uh, for the CF community at large is the introduction of this idea of a spectral coordinates. In other words, coordinates that define electromagnetic uh, radiation intervals of, the, of spectrum where the measurements are done. Typically in satellite data, that's called the band or channel. Um, and so that's, that's you know a new thing for the CF that pre previously dealt with latitude, longitude, you know pressure, vertical altitude, that kind of stuff, depth. Um, other other things, time and uh, and latitude and longitude are basically follow what's possible in the CF convention. Um, and uh, again, as the spectral coordinate now goes, we we covered all possible cases. We covered cases when the spectral coordinate is a a physical quantity like wavelength like wave number or frequency, or uh, in cases, say, of microwave instruments or even now in optical instruments, especially those that measure aerosol properties. Um, if you include polarization in, as part of your spectral coordinate, then uh, the values become alphanumeric. And so we covered both these cases, uh, monotonically increasing or decreasing, Physical quantity, uh, non, not monotonical physical quantity, and alphanumeric spectral coordinate. So we provide examples how to encode all these cases for spectral coordinates. Um, so that's about coordinates. Uh, the time coordinate is a little, uh, there is a twist for satellite data. Um, there are satellite data that use international atomic time. And that supporting an international atomic time is not really currently properly done. I think the issue is I think either the UD units that does not support international atomic time and conversion between Gregorian calendar and international atomic time or something like that. But anyway, that's one of the uh, one of the uh, uh, discovered problems or issues when it comes to supporting satellite data uh, in CF. Uh, so coming back to the the measurements and observation data itself. The proposal doesn't really only cover satellites. Uh, these things are equally applicable, say, to airborne uh, remotely sensed data or these unmanned uh, aerial systems. All these things qualify equally. Uh, we really focused on how things are encoded in, in files um, and what is the source of observation or really methods of observations. We didn't really pay that much attention. 
And um, the data that we talk about here are still in the original instrument observation uh, geometry. So no regraded satellite data, no cells, no nothing. This is really in most purest form. It starts as the measurements of electromagnetic radiation at, at the satellite instrument. Um, that's what in satellite business is called level one. Uh, we call here in this document radiometric swath data. And then that data gets converted into geophysical parameters. And we call that data geophysical swap data. And that's what also in, SWAT, in satellite business is called level two. And therefore here, what I'm, what I'm uh, now highlighting here are different ways how we name this possible encoding. So for the radiometric swap data, we identified two encoding types. One is multiband and multiband image. And what's the difference here is really are what is the what are the ranks of different arrays that represent coordinates and the swath observation data. Um, so those two are only for radiometric data, and there are what five, one, two, three, four, five, six um, various types of geophysical swath data encodings. And just to give you uh, an example, for example, this is a multiband, um, and we basically gave the example and this is this is a very classic way how um, satellite data uh, level one data would be stored in files and uh, for example once you use that data to turn it into geophysical parameter then that would be represented by um, by swath here um, encoding type so that's really very quick overview. I think there is only a couple of more minutes here. So uh, very quick um, run through this. Uh, what we covered also here are um, how to describe the footprint or the geospatial extent of, of each observation, because that you know, as we know, you know, the satellite measurements do uh, do not come from a single point on the Earth's surface. First, you're lucky if you see the surface. You, most of the time you see clouds, but you know, let's not complicate things. So if you assume that you're seeing surface, it doesn't come from you know, a single point. It's actually an area. And so we, we present here uh, the way how to do that in a special section, which I'm going to come here shortly. There you go, encoding geospatial extent. And, uh, and the good thing about this is that um, the approach is really uh, works for any small data encoding. It's not really dependent on different encoding types. Uh, it really introduces uh, new arrays, new variables, so-called boundary variables in the CF. And so uh, it can be done for any of these SWOT type encoding. Uh, groups are a big part of SWOT data, especially, for example, NASA's data use groups a lot for many, many years. So we said something about the groups, but we give the leadership on what actually happens and how to do these things to the group proposal that Daniel previously covered. And um, that's basically uh, as fast as, as I can go through this. Uh, so this uh, so this is consistent, the way you use groups is consistent with the group proposal? Yes, yes. Okay, yeah, good. Because the, um, a large part of actually group proposal was let's not cut a large number of sw uh, satellite data out yeah. So we need to pay nicely. Uh, uh, we can, ahead. Alexander, you can take a few more minutes. I mean, people might drop off, but um, right. if you have something that you really wanted to show, I think it would be good because, you know, we are recording this, so um, folks can tune in later. Um, you... Well, uh, we we exist on the on a, you know as as others we exist on GitHub as a. So basically, in Appendix B, um, there is a way we have we have sample files, very small sample files with different encoding types available for Hyrex and Thread, uh, and also you know any kind of issues we really invite you know people to submit GitHub issues or pull requests or things like that. And um, some problems for satellite data uh, that we uncovered that are really above this proposal, really issues for the CF convention itself, are for example. Um, geolocation data requirements for geolocation data they can really make satellite files humongous which is a problem for satellite data oh, providers do you, do you mean requiring like latitude and longitude or 
Yes, correct. Providing each, each observation with its own latitude and longitude, or if you are providing some kind of a map projection for your satellite data, this is the case for geostationary satellites, then if you really want to follow convention, you on top of that, those coordinates have to provide latitude and longitude for each observation as well. Now that's a double whammy. Yeah. Um, so that's the thing. The other problem is there are some satellite data like complex numbers. Uh, CF convention is, you know, basically has nothing on that, on that how to store set of complex numbers. Uh, issues like ocean surface wind vector data. Um, right now it's kind of uh, still in the, you know, there are some some practices and ways how it's done, but still not, you know, in the convention itself. Um, so that that those kind of things. We are now seeing uh, also satellite data that are um, in terms of the spectral coordinates, each observation has different number of samples per, you know, in the spectrum. Uh, for example, those aerosol measurement assessments, like the tropom emission in Europe, in Europe, they have for each observation, they have a different number of, of, of spec spectrum samples. And those values are different between observations. So again, it's it's issues that we would like to discuss with the CF convention um, because uh, you know once you move from the modeling numerical modeling world, measurement world is much more complicated and complex. Yeah. Um, and so in that way, it's kind of uh, we'll have to see how what things can go into CF convention. And that's it done. Okay. Well, thank you, Alexander. Um, does anybody have any questions that they'd like to ask? Actually, I had a, a question sort of for, I guess, all everybody who presented. Um, do you imagine that we could add uh, sort of a compliance? It, there's a compliance checker that tests for um, that I use, uh, the IUS program built that tests for all sorts of different things like ACDD conventions and CF discrete sampling geometries. And it, they have a U-grid checker in the works. I, I suppose that um, obviously we could make those additions to the checker for these different types. Is there any plans for that, or is that something we should try to get going as well? Well, uh, as far as the the groups draft is concerned, we've been using the NCOs. So basically, the NCOs implement the proposal. So if you trust the NCOs to process your uh, your variables to 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 implement the proposal correctly then you can just check and see if you can process stuff with that. That's not optimal. So I think having an independent checker would be of benefit. Okay. Yeah, same for same for the geometries. I think you just try your library and if it works, it works. <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, we were I'm just proud of us for having two implementations before the spec is out. <laughs> yeah, I'm proud of you too. I, I didn't mean to apply <laughs> otherwise. <laughs> no, no, but um, I, I think it would be it, it would be a good thing to engage soon because um, I uh, yeah I know there's a number of people that are thinking about using this already and having compliance checkers is really helpful. Yeah, and to support those compliance checkers, there's something called CF conformance, and I pasted a link to the conformance document in the chat window. So if you're writing one of these compliance checkers in the conformance document, you should see a set of rules. Oh, there you go. You're looking at it now. So mm -hmm. click on conformance.adoc. That's an ASCII doc format. So this is where we make revisions to the, these uh, these rules. So what you'll see is instead of like a nice uh, paragraph like explanation of the conventions, you see bullet points that are meant to be rules. If you're writing a compliance checker, you just check the boxes for these bullet points. If all the bullet points are met, then the file is in compliance. And if you're clever enough with your GitHub repositories, you can scroll up and find pull requests. There is a pull request for the geometry addition to these conformance rules. So the conformance rules for geometries are pretty much set at this point. Then it's just a matter of coding them up in whatever checker people have going on out there. Right, cool. Thanks, Tim. Oh, All right, everybody. Oh, yeah, no, go ahead. I'm not gonna, I mean, it's fine, fine, time to close this thing. No worries. Oh, I want to hear what you were going to say. <laughs> well, I mean, I just want to say, you know, the whole issue of compliance checking in CF is, uh, you know, interesting topic because, uh, you know, it would be good to have a at least two very capable implementations or at least one that covers the whole convention or something like that. But, you know, typically people develop compliance checkers for the data they are interested in. Uh, and so, uh, 
you know, these rules is a good idea. Um, I hope that this catches on, or you know, but it really takes effort to go through the entire now, especially now with CF convention, because it's now it, it, it you know it started lean, but I think even now CF convention is getting more and more, let's yeah. say, com complicated but mature. <laughs> Right. Well, the IUS the IUS checker is uh, Python. I think it's Python based, and it and it sort of has a um, sort of plugin type, uh, you know, architecture. So it should be accessible at least to Python folks. But uh, anyway, but yeah, there might be other approaches. All right. Well, thanks everybody. That was that was awesome, and uh, I think this is going to get a lot of. Um, this is great kind of with the CF meeting coming up. I, I think this will, if we share this out with the with uh, the community, I think there'll be a lot of um, good feedback, which will you can then also take to the meeting. So, um, thanks everybody again, and um, we'll see you next month. Well, yeah. Thanks, Rich. Bye. 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 Yep. Thanks. Bye. So I will, uh, I'll look for that recording on the um, page and I'll send the link. Awesome. Thanks, Annie. You bet. Good call. All right. Yep. Bye. Good. See ya.